high school in just two months' time. Stacy was working for a prominent allergist and was hoping to go to college. She had blonde hair, blue eyes, and a dazzling smile. Her mother, Ida, said that boys frequently called the house begging to date her teenage daughter. She was a wonderful daughter, she recalled. Susan was an honor roll student who had dreams of moving to the Sunshine State, Florida. She had brown hair and enchanting green eyes. She was outgoing and loved meeting new people, something her job as a hostess enabled her to do on a daily basis. She was there for her friends all at all times, said Susan's only brother, Rich Smalley. On March 19, 1988, the two girls were determined to make their last night of spring break count, and so they planned a sleepover at Stacy's house. Uh, that evening, Susan and Stacy climbed into Stacy's, Stacy's light yellow 1967 Mustang convertible and drove to the Preston Wood Shopping Center. Afterwards, they gave Susan's mother, Carolyn Audette, a lift home from her shift at a department store inside the mall. At Susan's house, the two girls changed their clothes before heading out again. Carolyn had a date that evening, and she told the girls to be careful, not knowing I'd never see them again. Stacy and Susan drove to a friend's party in Arlington. They left the party at around 10 p.m. and then went back to Stacy's house, where Stacy made a long distance phone call to a friend in Arlington. Despite the fact that they had a 12 a.m. curfew, the duo returned to the party shortly after midnight. Between 12.30 and 1 a.m., Susan and Stacy went to a steak and ale restaurant in Addison, where Susan worked as a waitress. Susan chatted to a boy she worked with, and then the girls left in the Mustang. It was the last time they were ever seen. When it was discovered that the girls hadn't slept in their beds that night, they were reported missing by their worried parents. Shortly thereafter, police found Stacy's abandoned Mustang on Forest Lane, on Forest Lane, which was then a popular Northwest Dallas strip boasting of a movie theater and drive-in burger restaurant. The doors were locked and the girls' jackets were found inside. For reasons that remain unknown even today, neither Dallas nor Carrollton police forensically searched the car for fingerprints or any form of DNA. Well, that's stupid. That's ridiculous. Two girls are missing. You find their car and you don't look for DNA or fingerprints, like what? <sighs> Detective Greg Ward, who took on the case four months later, said that the original investigative team had initially theorized that the girls were just runaways and looked at their disappearance with tunnel vision. I'm not saying they screwed up, he said, but they probably could have handled it better. I agree. When the news of the discovery broke, the families of the girls immediately believed that something sinister had happened to them. It was out of character for them to just vanish without letting anybody know where they were going. Moreover, the they were good students and ready to, to graduate and embark on a new adventure. There was no big event in their lives that would have forced them to flee, and there was
was no secret life that anybody was aware of. Over time, the investigators on the case also came to the conclusion that they were most likely abducted. The disappearances sent a chill down the spine of the residents of Carrollton, and the girls and the girls' absence taught their classmates a disturbing lesson. Anything could happen to anybody, said Rob Bader, a 17-year-old junior. It was a terrifying notion that this could have happened to any one of them. They were just two regular teenage girls enjoying their last bit of freedom before buckling down for college. While the main theory was that they had been abducted shortly after the disappearance was made public, two witnesses came forward to say that they had seen two girls matching the descriptions of Susan and Stacy on the night of their disappearance. According to the witnesses, they were hanging out at a popular drag race strip in a warehouse district near LBJ Freeway and Interstate 35E. These claims could never be substantiated, however. In pursuit of leads, Carrollton police contacted a local psychic, John Ketchings. During a three-hour consultation, Ketchings claimed that the teenagers had been abducted and murdered by a white man who was 28 to 34 years old with blonde hair and glasses. According to Ketchings, the man then dumped their bodies near Lake Grapevine. A search of the area turned up nothing. Early on in the investigation, Carrollton police were deluded with tips from people across the country. One lead came from a behavioral psychologist reported he had a feeling that the teenagers crossed the Mexican border with two men. Carrollton police also received a phone call from a woman who claimed she saw the girls in a Houston supermarket, while another caller said they saw the girls in a Madison, West Virginia saloon called Bob and Bees. One tip came from someone who said Madison was visiting an inmate at a state prison in Bushnell, Florida. Several weeks after the disappearance, Carlton police received a phone call from an unidentified person who said Susan and Stacy are alright before hanging up. The call came from an unrecorded line, meaning that the call couldn't be traced. Each tip led to a dead end. Following the disappearance, Stacy's family hired a private detective, but he was unable to produce any leads. They eventually fired him after spending more than $3,000. Over the ensuing years, Stacy's father, Frank Madison, continued to drive her eye-catching yellow Mustang in the hopes that somebody somewhere may recognize the car, triggering a, mem a memory that could lead to the discovery of the girls. It was like they were whisked off the earth, said Frank. Sadly, Frank passed away from cancer in 1996 without ever knowing what happened to his daughter. The main suspect in the disappearance was Stacy's boyfriend at the time, Kevin Elrod. One of Stacy's friends, Janine White, claimed that Stacy was once confided in her that Elrod was abnormally controlling and possessive. According to Ida, Stacy had been trying to end the relationship but couldn't figure out a way to peacefully call it quits. Earlier on in the afternoon before the disappearance, Stacy had told Ida that if Elrod called the house looking for her, to tell him that she was out with Susan. Uh, when he called, Ida followed her daughter's instructions. Even more alarming, according to Elrod's new girlfriend, 
Stacy and Susan with a shovel before burying them in a cemetery near State Highway 121. Elrod was questioned extensively and given a polygraph in 1988, which he passed. The cemetery was searched, but turned up no evidence of the duo. He said later that... Oh, he later said that he had said he killed them, purely because he was fed up with people asking about their disappearance and implying he was involved. Until next time.